Thank you, Kittrick. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, please guide the words of the people who are sharing today. Please help them to spread the, your upside-down kingdom and to help them show others what the power of the upside-down kingdom really has. And as we enter a time of thanksgiving, um, thank you for everything you've done for us and all the challenges you've guided us through. Amen. As many of you probably already know, the high school youth group went to New Orleans recently, the last summer, um, and there were speakers there. And the theme of that um, New Orleans trip was the Upside Down Kingdom. And exactly what the Upside Down Kingdom is, as you're all probably wondering, and as Kit really well demonstrated, is we take the pyramid where the king is at the top and we flip it upside down, where the king, or in, as the speaker said, Jesus, is on the bottom and it serves everybody else, even the servants. And that's what we're called to do. And um, we're gonna have some high school um, youth um, come share um, about where they see the upside on kingdom and, um, and how this um, changes their lives and how they're gonna use it to help others. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kit again and have him share. Matthew 19, 21 to 24. That's where I see the upside down kingdom. The verse reads, then Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he was very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I tell you again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that if you have a roof over your head and three meals a day on your table every day, you're in the top 10% of richest people on earth? It's scary to think that an impossible feat is easier than someone in middle-class America to make it to heaven. But what Jesus says in other verses is that the low will be made high. That's the upside-down kingdom. We will all become wealthy. We will all be servants, and we will all be kings. So that means we'll all have enough money to put in the offering plate, right? We'll have the biggest sanctuary, bigger than the church down the street. We'll be able to fund more missions. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says what's important is spiritual wealth. But sometimes in the church, we value mental wealth over spiritual wealth. Those with the gifts of preaching, of leadership, of management, they're held in high positions in the church, as they should be. That's their gift. But what about those with the gift of encouragement, the gift of love, the gift of giving people the benefit of the doubt? They sit by the sidelines. They're told, go build a school. Go do something else. Give money. We don't need encouragement. Sometimes we see the people who are not mentally wealthy. We see them as, as sinful, like Job's friends saw him as sinful. The people who have mental illnesses, they must be sinners. People who are stupid, they must be sinners. People who couldn't make it to college, they must be sinners. But that's not what Jesus says. But Jesus also doesn't say the upside down kingdom makes us all smart, makes us all able to solve complicated differential equations. He says that in the upside down kingdom, we see people differently. We see people as people we want to serve. We become servants and give our spiritual wealth to others so that they can be spiritually wealthy because that's what Jesus says is important. I see the upside down kingdom in Luke 14, 15 through 24. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the great banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come, he said, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke and oxen and I am on the way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master, and then, then the owner of the house became angry and ordered the, his servant 
Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, and there still is room. Then the master told his servant, go out in the roads and country lanes and compel them to do to come in and the house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will go get a taste of the banquet. In this story, the master's friends and neighbors did not want to come. So the master did something surprising. He invited people of lower status, the poor, the blind, the lame, and strangers far from his home. In the upside down kingdom, this is what Jesus tells us to do. Everyone is equal and welcome in Jesus' kingdom. This story is a challenge to live out in our daily lives. We normally like to be with friends or family we are comfortable being with. It is hard for us to spend time with people who are different, pushed aside, or strangers to us. Jesus asks us to stop and make time for these people who are overlooked by others. God loves everyone equally no matter who they are or where they come from. This story is a great challenge for us to reach out to others in our schools, churches, neighborhoods, or at work. Okay, to begin, I will read the story from John 13, verse 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, and drained supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wet them with the towel with which he was girded. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Lord answered him, What I am doing you do not know now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is clean all over, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew that who was to betray him, and that was why he said, You are not all clean. When he washed their feet and taken his garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so am I. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Okay. So when our youth group was in New Orleans at YouthWorks, we went to a worship session, and there we talked about the Upside Down Kingdom and the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Um, after that, they gave us the opportunity to reenact the situation, and the leaders of YouthWorks washed Rose, Philip, Jen, and Paul's feet, and then they washed the students' feet and prayed for us. In conclusion, this shows that the upside down kingdom because the leaders were washing the students' feet just like Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Matthew 19, 13 through 15. Then children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who had brought them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs to. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. The world values the great, the powerful, the strong. Even Jesus' disciples looked at these things and saw value. That's why they turned away the children. But Jesus called the children to him. He welcomed them into his kingdom with loving arms. He talked to them, held them, and loved them. 
What a shock to the disciples to see Jesus embrace and take time for the children who were without power and had little on the social ladder. This past summer, our youth group went to New Orleans. There, I worked at a summer day camp with children. The children who went to this camp were from urban, inner-city communities. Many of the kids' parents were working all day, so the kids would have little to do all summer without this camp. At the camp, we read Bible stories, talked about their lives, watched the VeggieTales version of David and Goliath, um, made crafts, sang songs, ate lunch, and played games. Throughout the week, I was able to observe how important this summer camp was. The leaders working there poured their lives into supporting the day campers. I could see Jesus' way through the little children each day, talking, listening, and encouraging the kids. Looking at these children, I was reminded of Matthew 19. Jesus values these children. Jesus loves these children. Jesus cares for these children. And so must we. We can do as Jesus taught us here today with the baptism of baby Joshua. We are called to love and care for, teach and mentor, nurture and guide the next generation. as we gather here this morning, we gather around these words, words of our faith. When God said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout all generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring. Then Paul reminds us of our inclusion in this covenant in Galatians. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This morning, as we gather together to baptize Joshua and welcome him into this family of God, we remember that from Abraham until now, we stand in a long line of the children of the covenant. For it is in baptism that God calls us all, no matter our age, children. For baptism is the sign and seal of God's promises to us, a covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins to adopt us into the body of Christ, the church, to send the Holy Spirit daily to renew and cleanse us and to resurrect us to eternal life. This promise is made visible in the water of baptism. Water cleanses, water refreshes, water sustains, and water purifies. Jesus Christ is the living water. Through baptism, Christ calls us to a new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world, and to live a new and holy life. And yet when we fall into sin, which we all do, we must not despair of God's mercy or continue in that sin, for baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. This morning we welcome... On the behalf of the Board of Elders, we invite Rosalind and Philip DeCoster forward for the sacrament of baptism for little Joshua Gordon. Rosalind and Philip, you stand before us and bring Joshua Gordon to receive the sacrament of baptism. We ask you, therefore, before God and Christ's church to reject evil, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the the power of sin and evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you promise to instruct Joshua in the truth of God's word and the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, to pray for him, to teach him to pray, to train him in Christ's way by your example through worship, and in the nurture of the church. I do, and I will strive to pray. Will the congregation please rise? In the Reformed tradition, we believe in a congregation serving as godparents of Joshua, and so we ask you as God's people, do you promise to love, encourage, and support this family by teaching the gospel of God's love, 
by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family and fellowship, prayer, and service? If your answer is yes, say we do and say it enthusiastically together now. We do. Together, as the people of God, we proclaim what unites us as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Joshua. Awesome. Joshua, though you know nothing of it yet, it is for you that Jesus came into this world. For you he died and conquered death. We love because God first loved us. We baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said together, Amen. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Joshua is now received into the visible membership of the church engaged to confess faith one day and to be God's faithful servant until life's end. Joshua, you belong to Jesus. He will never let you down, and he will never let you go. This time we welcome forward, the congregation may be seated, and we welcome forward all those ordained into the office of elder, whether you're an elder, uh, current or previous at American Reformed Church or another church, um, please come forward and join us. Uh, Rosalind and Philip, we'll ask you to stand forward, and the elders will lay hands on you as we pray for you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless you and give you thanks for the life of little Joshua. God, we do thank you that you claim him as your own, that your grace is at your own initiative, that your love for him is deep and wide. God, we do pray for this family. We pray for Rosalind and Philip as they lead and guide Joshua, as they instruct him in the faith. God, give them strength and courage. And God, bless this congregation, American Reformed Church, as we too have had made promises to raise Joshua in this truth, in this faith. On this Youth Sunday, as we see our youth stand before us and lead us in worship, we do pray that one day Joshua would be a part uh, of that experience, engaged on this day to confess his faith in Jesus Christ. God, thank you. We bless you for the gift of Joshua's life. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. The elders may congratulate Philip and Rose before returning to your seats. Now that we have learned where exactly these students have seen the Upside Down Kingdom, I'm challenging you to go forth and actually live the Upside Down Kingdom. Go out and serve other people who are above you or below you, um, in social standings, and change the world at one little bit at a time. One of my favorite movies, Pay It Forward, is a perfect example of this. Don't serve the person who helped serve you, go serve somebody else. And one little bit at a time, we can change the world for the better. Um, 
So now I'm going to quick run up for the choir, and I'm going to turn it over to Heather. We respond to the gifts of our king through the giving of our tithes and offerings. The deacons and fifth graders will come forward to receive these gifts. As they are doing so, please pass the fellowship pads down the row, and also please pass any food donations you have to the end of your pew to the student standing next to the deacon. The food donations will be used for SACPAC, a local nonprofit organization that provides food sacks to hungry children at Orange City Elementary, Hospers Elementary, and Orange City Christian Elementary schools. They are currently packaging about 70 packs each week. Come, let's give our gifts to God. <laughs> 